Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Jamie. It's my privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm here with my wife, Cheryl. She's sitting right back there. Hi, Cher. We have been married 30 years next month, so give her a hand. I had the privilege of being the senior pastor at Genesis Church down in Muskegon, and we have some of our church family here playing hooky this morning, so glad I got some friends there in the audience as well. And it's my privilege to be able to be here with you, so I want to thank Grace for inviting me to speak this morning at the chapel. Uh, I don't know many of you, and I don't like speaking to strangers, and some of you guys look pretty strange. So my name is Jamie. I, I, I want us all to be friends, so on a count of three, just shout your name back at me, okay? Nice and loud. One, two, three. Michael! I heard Michael really loud. <laughs> But now I know all of you, now we're no longer strangers, we are friends, we can dive into this. Let's have a conversation this morning about God's Word. I want to take a look at Psalm 73. It's one of my favorite psalms, and as you are turning there, if you happen to be kind of staying the summer here in the Grace area, in the Silver Lake area, I, I want to invite you back here next Sunday as my friend Steve Lister is preaching out of Psalm 127, one of those can't miss kind of weeks, so make sure you're here next week as well. Psalm 73 is one of my favorite psalms. And here's the reason why. Because it's one of those psalms that makes me feel like I'm somewhat normal. Because when it comes to following God, I don't know about you, but when it comes to following God and living for God, there are times where I do not do everything right. Am I alone in this? There are days where I get to the end of my day and I'm thinking, that was not my best day. There are, there are times where I look back and I'm thinking, oh my word. And then there's this. How many of you, if you had a chance to simply ask God some questions, you got some things you want to talk to God about? Anybody here? A couple? The rest of you guys are probably lying. I, I, I got questions for God. I got lots of questions. Not, not the dumb questions like, did Adam and Eve have, have a belly button? I, I don't care about that. I mean like legit, real life kind of questions I want to talk to God about. And that's what the author of Psalm 73 really addresses. And he talks about the cycle of emotions that many of us go through on loving God, not loving God. Well, let's take a look at this. Psalm 73, you can follow along on the screen. I encourage you to open your Bibles, follow along there as well. I want to read for us the first 12 verses where Asaph, the author, writes, Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing, my feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives, and their bodies are, are, are so healthy and strong. They, don't, they do not have troubles like other people. They are not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak evil in their pride, and they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these people, these wicked people, enjoying the life of ease while their riches multiply. If we get one main idea out of this morning, I want you to know this truth. It is good to be near God. At the end of the day, no matter what's going on around you, no matter how your life happens to be falling apart or going well, it is good to be near God. Now, I, I, I struggle with something. I realized as I was preparing for this sermon that I have, I have a, I wouldn't call it a disease, I'd call it a disorder. I have what I've labeled uh, SBD, which I would call spiritual bipolar disorder. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all mocking the mental disorder. I'm saying that when it comes to, to being strong spiritually, I have a spiritual bipolar disorder. That is, I go from loving God to not loving God all in the same minute. Are you with me? I go from trusting God to doubting God. I go from thinking God is good to wondering if God is good at all. 
And somebody please help me. Am I alone in this? Do you guys struggle with this as well? Thank you. I want to be real this morning. I want to talk about something that I think is relevant to every one of us here. That is, I think that most Christians simply struggle to be consistent when it comes to living for God. We have this this disorder where we go up and we go down, we go up and we go down, and we love God, we don't love God, we, we trust God, we don't trust God, we follow God, we walk away from God, and we just struggle to be consistent. And aren't you grateful that we have a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and is not up and down like we are up and down, and that allows us to have these emotional battles within us? Really messes with the people back there. <laughs> At the end of the day, it, it's a God that has his arm open. So let's just be raw and honest with each other today. Is this mic doing okay? Okay. It's good to be near God. I am always on this journey of doubt. I'm a pastor. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm a spiritual leader. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm on this, yeah, I struggle with what? What did I say? I struggle with doubt. Do you guys struggle with doubt? I mean, I know we're not supposed to say that, but let's just be honest. Can we be real here this morning? There are times where I just wonder, does God really know what he's doing in this world? I mean, look at politics right now. We have to vote this year. Side note, if you're putting your hope in politics, change that in a hurry. Put your hope in God, all right? But does God really know what he's doing? I, I struggle with doubt. Can I, can I trust God? Is God even good? On this journey of doubt, I think that we have four stops on this journey of doubt. And I want to follow the story of Asaph as he writes in the just kind of raw, honest, heartfelt truth here in Psalm 73, where he says, first of all, that God is good. He says, number one, the first stop is that God is good. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I know that we know the truth, but do we believe the truth of this, that God is good? Now, if you have any kind of church background right now, help me out because you know how to finish this. God is good, all the time. Mm, and all the time. God is oh, I know we know this, but do we feel it? Do we believe it? Do we practice it day in and day out? Are we living life like God is indeed good in every part of our life? That's where Asaph starts this whole psalm in verse 1, where he says, truly God is what? Oh, do better than that. Truly God is what? He is good. He is good to those whose hearts are pure. He's saying God is on the throne and God is good. Asaph, a little background, he is a worship leader in King David's courts. He is up here doing what these people were up here doing this morning, leading us in worship, and he was good at it. And he's saying to all of us, God is good. We read later on in Psalm 116 verse 5 it says how kind the Lord is how what's the word oh you don't have the verse up there Psalm 116 5 there we go how kind the Lord is how what good he is how good he is the goodness of God is not dependent upon our acknowledgement of it the goodness of God is not dependent upon our agreement with it The goodness of God is not dependent upon whether we feel it or not on a given day. God is good regardless, amen? God is good. In fact, we read also in chapter, James chapter one. James chapter one says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God the Father. Whatever good we have in our life is a gift given to us by God because we have a good God. We serve a good God. We love a good God. Stop number one on the journey of doubt is that God is good. Say it with me. God is good. One more time. God is good. Not like you mean it. God is good. 
but. Now we got stop number two. Stop number two in the journey of doubt is I don't think God is good. It takes a turn here in a hurry. In verse one, Asaph writes, truly God is good to Israel. But then in verse two, he says this, but as for me, everybody say, uh-oh. Mm. But as for me, he says, I almost lost my footing. I know God is good, but as for me, I almost began to slip. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone because he starts to wander a little bit and say, I don't, I don't think God is good. I, I, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the world around me and I don't know that God is indeed good. And he goes on to describe it because he says, the wicked are winning. He sees the world around him. He envies the proud when he looks at them and he sees that they are winning in spite of their wickedness. So let me pause here for a moment and hit some hot buttons. Just kind of touch on them momentarily. If we look at the world around us, are we going to see that the wicked are winning in our country? Can we talk about gender confusion for a moment? Can we talk about public and school libraries giving kids, children, books, suggesting they can choose what gender they want to be? The wicked are winning. Can we talk about, can we talk about abortion rights, which now in commercials are being disguised as reproductive rights? Have you caught that recently? Where you have young women on these TV commercials saying, I, no one can tell me what to do with my body. It's my body, my choice. But they say, I need to have all the reproductive rights available to me. Don't, don't take that away from me. Really what they're saying is, if I want to kill somebody, I can kill somebody. Ooh. We look at the world around us and the wicked are winning. That's exactly what Asaph is doing right now. He's looking at the world around him and he's saying the wicked are winning and he begins to wonder if that is true, is God really good? How can a good God let bad people get away with doing those evil things? Come on. And Asaph begins to doubt. He begins to wonder. We can talk about the whole woke movement. We can talk about how everybody's offended about everything. You do understand that God says my truth is offensive. Now we preach the truth in love, but we still preach the truth, right? Because this is the firm foundation upon which we stand. All other ground is what? Uh-huh. So if we preach the truth of God's word, are people going to be offended? Does that change the truth? Your offense does not change God's truth. Truth is truth. But when the wicked get away with what they're doing, you begin to wonder, is God really good? Is God paying attention? Does God know what's happening right now? If there is a God, the evil are saying, then he must be blind, deaf, and dumb because he's not doing a thing. The wicked are openly mocking God. And to them, the thought of a God that might hold them accountable, <laughs> it's ridiculous. They're laughing at it. They're free from troubles. They get away with everything. And Asaph is looking at it and he's thinking, why not do what they're doing? His path to doubt. He almost slips. And he's thinking, God is not, he's not doing anything. It's not, it's not fair. You ever think that as a Christian? It's not fair. And he's jealous of them. So we don't, we don't have time to reread Psalm 73, verses 2 through 12. But if you were able to, go back and reread it. Because what happens there 
in verses 4 through 12 specifically is that Asaph details how the wicked are winning, how they're getting away with it, and how they're bragging about it. He says they're boasting, they're boasting about what it is that they're doing. Do we have that going on today? Where the wicked are bragging about their wickedness? This is the month of June. I heard somebody just whisper it. Pride month. Pride month. Are the wicked bragging about their evil? Mm-hmm. Are they getting away with it? Yep. Where's God in all of this? See, what happened thousands of years ago when Asaph wrote this is happening right here in America today, right now, this moment. My son Ty said he went to Grand Haven a couple days ago to go walk the pier. And there was a gay pride movement that was going on in downtown Grand Haven. Now, God never justifies sin. He never gives up on a sinner and always allows them a chance to repent, correct? But he never justifies the sin. And Asaph is looking around going, <clears throat> what do I do? It's not fair. And he's asking the question that all of us at some point in time ask, if not even now, is following God even worth it? Have you ever wondered that? Is following God even worth it? I know I'm pushing hot buttons this morning. I'm just trying to be honest and real. No, we got a bunch of camp staff right here in the front. You have to say following God is worth it. Your job depends on it right now. <laughs> but isn't it true where we look around and think, ah, why bother? Why bother doing what is right? Why bother trying to live for God? What, what does it even matter? See, that's where Asaph is. He starts out by saying God is good. That's great. He's perfect. But then he starts to look at the world around him and he's like, ah, I don't know if God is good or not. I don't think God is very good at all. Verse 13, he said, did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. And every morning brings me pain. What's the point in being godly, he says. What's the point in being a Christian? What's the point in going to church? The wicked get whatever they want, and I'm left wanting. In fact, he says, I live for God, and I got trouble. I live for God, and I've got problems. I live for God, and I've got all kinds of pain. And it seems like I'm being punished for the one that's being godly. At this point, he's writing it down, but he keeps it all to himself. Look at, look at verse 15. If I had really spoken this way to other people, I would have been a traitor to your people. You're like, I, I, can't even, I can't even talk about this with other Christians because I might take them down with me. But do you ever have, look at me, look at me, look at me. Do you ever have those moments of doubt that's so severe that you're wondering, should I even live for God? Just nod your head. Let me know. Yeah, me too. Because your boss doesn't care, right? They'd rather you not live for God. They'd rather you not have integrity. They want you to be sneaky in how you give a sales presentation. Mm. It's all about the money. We can give example after example. The wicked are getting away with it. Asaph says, my feet had almost slipped. Almost. Stop number three. Stop number three. First stop is God is good. We like that one. Second stop is I, I, I don't think God is good. The third stop is maybe God is good after all? Question mark? Maybe he is? He's just about to be swept away. His feet are just about to be kicked out from underneath him. Then he says this. 
Verse 16. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. But then, somebody say then. Mm. Then I went into, where did he go? Sanctuary. Oh God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. He spends all this time looking at the world around him, being influenced by the world around him, being overcome by the evil of the world around him. And he's about ready to give up on God. He's about ready to throw in the towel. He's about ready to be done with his faith. He's just, he can't, he can't hang on anymore. But then he enters the sanctuary of God and everything changes. Then he goes back to the presence of God and everything regains perspective. And he learns some things when he goes back to God. He learns that when I stand where God stands, I see what God sees. He spent all this time away from the presence of God, doubting the goodness of God, seeing people far from God, doing things against God. And he begins to wonder, is there goodness in God? And he almost gets converted to the other side, to the dark side. <laughs> but then he goes back to the presence of God. And when he enters the presence of God, he sees what he never, did not see before. You see, when you stand where God stands, you see what God sees. But when you stand where you stand, all you see is what you see. And everything changes when you enter the presence of God. And he went from doubting God to saying, maybe there is goodness in God. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe there is goodness in God. And he saw the perspective of the eternity. Verses 18 through 20. He says, truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. And he sees their destiny. They seem secure in what they are doing. They're getting away with it, and it seems like they're going to be okay. But Asaph sees what God sees. He's like, uh-oh. Their end is not going to end well for them. They will pay the price for their evil ways. God will hold them accountable for their sinful lifestyle and choices. Maybe not right now, but he will in the future. That's what he sees. That's what he sees. The destiny of the wicked. And then, and then Asaph says this. I appreciate this part, verses 21 and 22. And then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and so ignorant and I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. Another version says a brute beast. He's talking to God here. He's like, God, I, I know that you're good. Oh, but I'm looking at the world around me and I, I, don't, I don't think that you're good anymore. But then I came back into your presence and I see it from your perspective. I see what their destiny is going to be, that you are going to hold them accountable. They are going to pay the price for their sin. But God, the way that I acted, I was so ignorant. I was so foolish. And he says, I must have seemed like a, just a, a, a senseless animal to you, God. How many times have you and I acted like that? How many times today? <laughs> I, aren't you glad that God never gives up on us? That God does not just write us off? That God allows us to have this emotional roller coaster up and down of doubting Him, trusting Him, doubting Him, trusting Him? And Asaph is like, again, Asaph is a worship leader, right? He's, he's one of these people up here leading us in, before the throne by way of music. It's good to be near God. It's good to be near God. You 
You see, doubting and questioning how God handles life circumstances is not wise. God sees more than we see. He knows more than we know. He understands more than we understand. In fact, his thoughts and ways are what? Are higher than our thoughts and ways. Always. Always. That brings us to our fourth and final stop on the journey of doubt. The fourth stop is that it's good to be near God. It is good to be near God. Verses 23 to 26. He says, yet I belong to you. I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My, heart, my health may fail, my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart, and he is mine forever. And Asaph said that nearness to God is filled with the blessings of God, and that God's going to be with me every step of the way, and God's blessings are always greater than worldly treasures. So while it looks like the world is getting away with, with being evil, he reminds us that worldly treasures are nothing compared to godly blessings. Come on. It's always good to be near God. It's always good to stay true to God. It's always good to come back to God. When we get sidetracked and we look at the world around us and get influenced by them and we come back to reality that God is indeed good, he reminds us that God's blessings are always better than what the world has to offer around us. He says it's good to be near God. It's good to be near him. And the only thing that matters for us is God. He's all that we have. He's all that we need. He always sustains us. And God is always there. And God guides us past all the slippery places. So when our feet begin to slip, and when we begin to doubt, and when we begin to fall away, God is there to catch us and pull us back up if we let him and walk us back into a new perspective. That's what Asaph discovers. That's where he leads us to. And he just says it all leads back to the goodness of God. Look at how he ends the chapter. Verses 27 and 28. He says, to those that desert him, uh, they, they will perish. For you destroy those who abandon you. Verse 28. But as for me, but as for me, how good it is to be where? To be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things that you do. So here's Asaph's round trip journey. He says, God is good. He says, I'm struggling to believe that God is good. I can see clearly now that God is good. It's good to be near God. That's the path he goes on. That's his journey of doubt. He comes full circle all the way around. He says, I'm coming back to God because God is. I'm coming back to God because God is. I'm coming back to God because God is always good. He's always good. Even when we are overcome by life, even when we fall to temptation to sin, God is still good. God is still God, and God is still good. He does not cast us aside. He lets us have our moments of doubts. He lets us fear. He lets us wonder. He lets us question. But God is still. And Asaph says, it is good to be in the presence of God. He said, I, I know God is good. But there are days where I look at the world around me. There are days where I watch the news. <laughs> there are days where I read all these things that on the internet and they have to be true because it's on, it's on Facebook, right? It has to be true. There are days where I wonder, is God even good? Does God even care? Is God even there anymore? But then I get back into the presence of God. Then I get back into reading God's word. Then I get back into a church setting. Then I get back surrounded by God's people and I regain perspective. That's why it's so good that you're here this morning. Because we all need that fresh perspective. We all need that realignment. We all need that encouragement. We all need to be brought back to the truth that God is good. Because Satan fills the entire rest of our day and week telling us that God is not good. He comes full circle and says, it is good for us to be near God. Can I ask a question to you this morning? What are you looking at? 
Asaph got in trouble because his eyes went from looking at God to looking at the world. And when he looked at the world, he began to doubt the goodness of God. What are you looking at? Where are your eyes at right now? What are you reading? What are you watching? Who are you following? Who's influencing you? What are you believing? Because all that influences you and changes you and can take you away from God. Where are your eyes at? For Asaph, he got in trouble. He began to doubt when he went from looking at God to looking at the world around him. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 3. It says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from where? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And oh, this is so good. And he will not let what? He won't let you slip. He won't let you fall. He's got a hold of your hand. He's walking you through step by step, day by day, so the evil around you has no power over you. If you're in the presence of God, if you're a child of God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Come on. And he will always step you through all the evil that is influencing you as long as your eyes are lifted up from here to here. Because where does my help come from? Lift up your eyes, church. Lift them up. Lift up your eyes, Christian. Look at the God around you and focus on him. This is why Hebrews says, we'll end with this. Hebrews says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw up everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us do what? Fix your eyes on, (laughs) sorry, I can't read that far back there. I'm going to read my notes. My eyes are bad. We're on perseverance. The race has marked out for us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Right? That's where we have to be looking. We're on perseverance. The race has marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You do realize that we have a savior right now that is seated in authority, reigning over the world right now at the right hand of the throne of God. He's not pacing the floors of heaven. He's not walking back and forth going, I never saw that one coming. I have no idea how to handle the situation. It's it's Pride Month right now. What what in the world do I do? All these things are happening in the world around. We have a God who is sovereign. We have a God who is good. We have a God who is in control. We have a God who is more than able. Right? It's about time we live like that. It's about time we believe that. It's about time we trust that. So Asaph begins the psalm and he ends the psalm. Verse 1, he says that God is what? And verse 28, he says that God is what? And in the middle, he went all over the place. What you can do as long as you end with God is good. As long as you believe and live and act and hold on to the truth that God is good. Do you believe that? Do you know that? Do you trust that? Do you feel that? Are you going to live that out? That's our call this morning, church. Can we make that happen? Because we, (laughs) listen, we're called to be the light of the world. And we live in the world that needs to see the goodness of God. Amen? Let's go make that happen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you let us walk in circles that you let us have emotions, that you let us go up and down, that you let us have these irrational moments with you, that you allow us to walk through this journey, that you promise that if we hold on to you, that you will not let our feet slip as long as our eyes are focused on you, as long as we are looking at you. So God, may we lift up our eyes to the hills because where does our help come from? It comes from you alone. It comes from you. May we not be so influenced by the evil world around us that we lose our footing that we lose hope. May we always hold on to the truth that it is good to be near God because you are good. So good, let us, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to run the race. Help us to live for you. Help us to show your goodness to the world around us. Use us. 
to change the world. Praise all in Jesus' name. Together we said amen and amen.